No one is supposed to see yet what for the very first time is driving on a public road. May 7th, 2014, in the Netherlands. Reconstruction of a technical masterpiece. It all begins in June 2001 with a coincidental find. In a warehouse, workers find auto parts, which shouldn't really exist. The guessing begins. There, take a closer look. The chassis is of a very rare car type from the 1930s, but something's different. The parts we found there were unusual. Those were not serial parts. This was the chassis and some auto parts from a time when car development was rapidly evolving. The building of the motorways in the 1930s made it possible to drive long distances at high speed. Car manufacturers reacted to that. The special vehicle production is opened at Mercedes-Benz factory in Zindelfingen near Stuttgart. It could be compared to today's special design and development departments. What was developed and built here in the 1930s is today worth millions. On the motorways in the 1930s, that's a rather relaxed affair. Most cars are driving 80 to 90 kilometers per hour maximum. Not so the vehicles of the special vehicle production. These supercars of their time are sometimes twice as fast. But which car is this? Is it a lost prototype? That's part of the body. That's metal from the body. Aluminum 38, that's rare. They didn't really build cars in aluminum, so even at that time, aluminum bodywork was only for sports and racing cars. Traces of color give more hints about the car and leave but one conclusion. We're assuming, on the information we have, that this is a one-off, it's unique. To be absolutely sure about the origin of the car, Gert Lange goes to the company archive of Daimler AG. We've got the biggest company archive of any car manufacturer, so if we're looking for something, we'll find it there. Here, in books and on microfilm, the experts can find any car ever built in the company's history. Prototypes, too, are filed in the books. But some information got lost during the war. Can the car be identified nonetheless? Indeed. The archive contains several pictures and plans of the car. Sensational. It's a car which was developed in the late 1930s to compete in a long distance race. So, naturally, one feels like rebuilding it. You want a car again, not just a frame. A couple of months later, that's exactly what it's all about. Gerd Langer and Ralf Hettich present their results. With them are Jürgen Wittmann, director of the archive and the car collection, Klaus Reichert, director of the workshop and the parts section of Mercedes-Benz Classic, and Michael Bock, Director of Mercedes-Benz Classic. Super project. Okay. It's a great project. Go ahead. Mercedes products are created here. We've developed them, we've designed them, and that's why we've got the responsibility to rebuild them to the same standard as they were once made and delivered to the customer. More than 70 years earlier, the special vehicle production is tasked to build a car for the 1938 Berlin-Rome rally. In 1934, Mercedes-Benz had already successfully participated in the 2,000 kilometers through Germany rally. The secret sauce, a streamlined body. Based on this experience, a unique car with a revolutionary shape is created. More than 70 years later, Ralf Hettich and Gerd Lange hang up the original plans of the car. What we here is, um, in a 
What we're seeing is a plan, a historical plan from 1938. And this plan is an exact description of the surface, of the build of this car. The plan shows the ideas and thoughts of the designers and engineers back then. The question today is, is it possible to rebuild this car exactly like that? Just according to plans and photos, and using exactly the methods that were employed in the 1930s. A gigantic task with unknown result. In Italy, the unusual body is to be rebuilt to its original condition. Artistically handcrafted. The plan and the chassis of the car have already arrived in Italy. The frame was made of ash wood, which because of its elasticity is the favorite material of wheelwrights and coach builders. For this one-off, every wooden piece had to be elaborately hand-carved. This Italian family company has specialized for several generations now on exactly this. Managing director Paolo supervises the project. I started from a drawing, from a 2D drawing of the Mercedes-Benz, and then I made a new drawing in one, one one scale. I made all the pieces of this wooden frame. After that, I should, I have checked 100 times that all fit perfectly. And this is the, the hardest job to do. Already the very first impression shows that an extraordinary form is being created here. This car is unique, so it's pretty hard to get some orientation, which of course makes it even more difficult. It's this demanding attitude to come as close as possible to the original. Just a little example. Since there were no Phillips screws in the 1930s, they're replaced. This car offers a great opportunity. We have material from the archive, historical plans, a chassis and other original parts. We didn't have to start from scratch just having a vague idea of a car that once was. The engines of the compressor cars back then were real beasts, having up to 180 horsepower. At that time, absolutely top-notch for road cars. And another lucky coincidence, Mercedes-Benz stored an engine which corresponds exactly to the one used in the newly discovered car. We don't know what we'll see when we open up the engine for the first time. It's an exciting moment. Especially since the engine wasn't used for many years. We'll disassemble the engine completely. The worst case scenario is if galling occurred in the pistons. That you can't see from the outside. It'll take almost a whole year to get the engine up and running. The car isn't used for its intended purpose, as the Berlin-Rome rally is postponed, then abandoned. The future of this gem is uncertain, and the search for additional traces commences. The life of a car doesn't end after delivery. That's actually more when it starts. And if you want to tell or understand the story of such a car, you should look outside the archives of Daimler AG as well. The forensic car experts leave no stone unturned. Even documents from other companies are checked. After weeks of searching, they finally find something. During our research, a brochure regarding Dunlop's 50th anniversary turned up, and it was referring to a streamlined car, which was clocking 170 on the motorway. Could that be the mysterious car? 
There's evidence, but doubts remain. Too much is yet unknown. In dem stadium, at this stage, you can't be sure, as maybe you read too much into something, even though you'd really wanted that. In June 1938, the extraordinary car is delivered to tire manufacturer Dunlop in Hanau, as the order book kept in the archive shows. In the summer of the year 2013, a fascinating experiment begins. The experts from near Venice know their trade, which, like that, is rarely executed anymore, handcrafted aluminum. Slowly, the car gains a recognizable shape. The challenge is, though handcrafted, the work still has to be exacting. A deviation of a millimeter is already too much. Just a little error in the calculation, and all was for nothing. We've got historical plans, and they're pretty detailed. And then the car was built, and that in a short time. So maybe the worker saw some things from a different vantage point and said, well, I could do that differently. And maybe talk to the developer. And then, for example, this gas cap, which you can see on the photo, made that differently to how it's drawn on the plans. Our goal is to come as close to the original as possible. So we're using these plans and the photographs that's researching. It's quite an effort. You can't just concentrate on one part. We're using everything we have at our disposal and try to find our way through. Dunlop, it seems, wanted the car for some trials. In the 1930s, they wanted to test how much their high-performance tires could stand. It would be the ideal car for that. Another indicator. Foreman at the garage and driver at Dunlop at that time, Karl Hammes. Another piece of the puzzle, which either leads to nothing or closer to solving it. Are there any remaining witnesses who could tell more about the car? That's one of those pieces, you don't count on it. You're thinking of all sorts of things, put together some system, how you do your research, with which, together with the archive, you look for traces. When you hear something like that, that's like winning the lottery. Foreman Karl Hamas has a son, who likes to hang out at the garage of his father. My technical contact at Dunlop was Ingo Hamas, who is director of tire testing. The thing is, his father and also his grandfather were at Dunlop and knew the car. They were actually sitting in it. That's the breakthrough. It's possible to get information which only witnesses can give, and Mercedes-Benz is lucky. The little boy from back then is now a sprightly 82-year-old. If you're so lucky to have a witness who can contribute to this project, so that this story becomes even more informative and even more fact-based, then that's a real gem, a lucky strike. A journey in time. For the first time in more than 70 years, the elderly gentleman is sitting in one of his favorite cars. Mercedes-Benz is expecting some tips regarding the interior and the engine. To this day, Hamas is fascinated by the impressions from his youth. These huge garages at Dunlop, it always smelled of oil, petrol, and exhaust fumes. That was the smell, and we liked it. The powerful eight-cylinder engine should provide for high speeds. Top speeds could be reached by switching on the compressor. Father wasn't driving as fast as he could have, I think. The car could reach a top speed of 186 kilometers per hour when the compressor was switched on. Well, I don't really know that. The weight of the car is thought to be 2.4 tons, enormous. Can this Colossus be propelled to such high a speed? Well, we do demand from ourselves to do the job properly. And then we would like to see the 185 on the test track, to show that the idea 
The concept was absolutely correct and feasible, anchored in reality. Change of location. Putin near Amsterdam in the Netherlands. June 2013. Here too, specialists are at work to prepare the next steps. Our goal here is to get a rolling chassis ready in the coming weeks. The principle of frame on axles and wheels to give to the coach builders. The problem is, the work on engine, body and chassis are done in parallel. It's fantastic that Mercedes-Benz gives you the opportunity to realize such a project at such a high level. That's extraordinary. And that under time pressure. The schedule demands a parallel execution. By now it seems certain that Dunlop used this unique car for testing tires. The goal was to test the maximum strength of the tires. And that leads directly to the next hurdle. How can you make sure that a tire has the exact same build as in the 1930s? Today, Dunlop is still producing tires for valuable vintage cars. Among them, some special types which fit into that time and to our car. A real test begins with unknown results. Basically, the tire is constructed the same way as 70, 80 years ago. And again, a member of the Hamas family is working in a pivotal position at Dunlop, Ingo Hamas, grandson of the then foreman of the garage. The mood is tense. If the tire doesn't stand the strain, the whole project will be questioned. The latest technology should help answer that question. The tire is the link between road and vehicle. And especially in this case, where we have a very heavy and fast car with a historic tire. It's important that the tire will be able to cope with these demands. The start of the test isn't very spectacular. The tire handles the increasing speed without problem. But those aren't yet peak values. This goes very smooth, great. When the tire approaches its limits, you'd hear a noise, which wasn't there before. That's exactly what we don't want to do today. We just want to find out whether the tire works with the streamlined car. Carefully, the velocity is nudged towards the top speed. Everything seems okay. It's, 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 it's okay. Now you can already see it. Okay. 180, okay. Just check the clock here. A bursting tire at 185 kilometers per hour would be catastrophic, and uh, the consequences can't really be estimated. The coming minutes are decisive. Failure would delay the project for months. The car wouldn't be allowed to drive 185 kilometers per hour. Then it happens. At first you flinch and think, hmm, really, project goal 185 won't be. Yeah, not Everybody in the room knows we've got to find the fault as quickly as possible. The test stand just switched itself off, which means there was a problem coming. The problem was obviously not the tire, but an angled valve, and because of its inertia, it virtually ripped off the tube. A dicey situation. And there's the delinquent. So if we'd been driving at that speed, then we would have experienced a sudden pressure loss. So the inner tube would, there would just be no air. So the tire would have lost its side traction. And then, well, at that speed, you can just imagine what happens. Final test, second chance. Another trial begins. Is the expert's analysis correct? 
This trial shows in a wonderful way how it all is the sum of its parts, the whole system. Everything has to work in order for the car to function safely. As that is the precondition, given all passion, safety still comes first. And for that, you need the perfect tire. Now we're already one minute above 190. Looks really good. What was important then was testing, testing, and testing. While the tire problem got solved, the mechanics and Fellbach are working on the engine. The motor is completely disassembled. Every part meticulously cleaned and checked for damage. But after repairing and reassembling several hundred parts, the whole thing isn't necessarily ready to go. And top speeds aren't guaranteed either. In order to test whether the machine stands a chance to actually reach the performance that is expected, it too is evaluated with the help of modern technology. One of the most advanced test stands for engines in the world is at the Mercedes-Benz factory in Untertürkheim. Here, every engine from smart to S-class gets a painstaking checkup. Today, the heart of the company is concerned with the past. From taking it out to putting it here, nine months have passed. There's always some excitement and we're giving, of course, our very best. The problem here is, is our 70-year-old technology compatible with the high-tech test stand? Will they work together? We'll find that out within the next minutes. Testing begins. The rare interaction between high-performance analytics and engineering from the 1930s fascinates everyone involved. We've been testing a couple of vintage engines here, but not this one yet. It's always a challenge, and there's always respect for the age of the motor. We think it's great. Approaching the essential question, the engine is slowly revved up. Already the first results astonish the project coordinator. So what we're seeing here, 2,000 RPM and 290 Newton meter, that's a top value. And the temperature is optimal, which is a precondition to start the last part of the test. Let's run the compressor test. In a moment, a sound will signal that the compressor adds 75 horsepower. Successful. What we'd expected regarding the engine and its reliability, 100%. We're where we wanted to be. Right? Yeah, now you can see the old guys are still going strong, even in retirement. <laughs> In the meantime, in Italy, this powerful beauty takes an ever more concrete shape. And it becomes ever more clear. This is a milestone in the art of coach building. Welding aluminum by hand at this level of precision, that's a job for this special workshop. You can recognize the car as a whole, with its gigantic dimensions for the first time. You can see how beautifully streamlined, how organic the forms are. And this part of the process doesn't allow for mistakes either, as the connecting of the components is approaching fast. 
Most impressive, this car has charisma, a presence. It's got real character. Stuttgart, February 22nd, 2014, the next phase. The half-finished vehicle in the workshop has to show what it's worth. Laden with weights in wooden boxes, it's about to be tested whether everything works as planned. The test track next to the factory, where new models usually get tested, comes in handy for the trials. We take the car to the test track, and we want to reach the originally envisaged top speed of 185. Drive that, and of course we'll see to it that this car is safe. The two-kilometer-long test track with its banked turns is, alas, not suited to reach top speeds. It's precisely moments like these where you question yourself. Have you thought of everything? You've got to be wide awake, concentrated and then sensitively, step by step, inch closer to the situation. And everything goes well. The car behaves as everybody had hoped for. Another small step towards the grand final. A perfect maiden voyage. And that really generates excitement for the whole car we're going to see in a couple of months. In the Netherlands, everyone is preparing for the moment, which in the automobile business is lovingly called the wedding. Important components have to fit together now. Today is a big day. Today, everything comes together what belongs together. The body is put on the chassis. Worst case, we've got some big measurement error, or some tool is made such that the parts won't fit together. Well, we'll have to see what to do then. But I hope everything fits well. And now, muscle power again. The decisive moment. Six hundred kilograms approaching the chassis. The wedding should show whether the teams in different locations have done a proper job, solved all the problems under time pressure. It was so tight. All these connections between body and frame, that's like two to three millimeters, which do the trick, and it works. Some final moves before the first comparison with the photos from 1938. The car isn't painted yet, but everybody is content already. When the car stood on its wheels for the first time, when it was possible to grasp it in three dimensions, that was a great feeling. Everybody was impressed. In August 1945, the car is taken away. American officers like this unusual vehicle. To the regret of Gerd Hamas, Dunlop has to part with the car. What happens next cannot be completely reconstructed. And that's how the car really looked like. Netherlands, May 7th, 2014.
Today is the preliminary high point of the project. The original from back in the day is about to prove itself. The car is being prepared for a night outing. No one's supposed to see the result of thousands of work hours yet. The technicians want to play it safe. Now we're checking the proper working of the pedals. It's extremely important that everything is running as we expect it to do. Today's the commissioning of the car, and come dusk, we'll start the test drive. If a pedal wouldn't be working properly, became stuck while driving, that would be the worst that could happen, as the car wouldn't be controllable anymore. That's why we ensure beforehand that everything is working 100%. It's moments like these which change a situation, between pride and doubt, between success and failure. From a perfectionist's perspective, something can always happen. Don't believe in success too early. That's a very emotional moment. The car is ready to go. On the other hand, you've got to concentrate on the task. It's not like we've put it together and then deliver 110%. Usually, something happens. Like now, the car breaks down, trying to find the fault in the middle of the night. I mean, okay, if an engine fails, there are usually two points to look at, either electricity, ignition, or fuel. We looked at it, fuel is there, but there's something unusual. Strangely, the reserve tank is empty, even though the main tank hasn't been used yet. The problem is to be solved during the night. After having switched the system, it has a reserve tank and the main tank. It worked again, but in this case it shouldn't have. Half an hour to midnight, it's back to the workshop. Apparently, a valve in the fuel line has been put in the wrong way. If you were always certain that nothing's going to happen, then you wouldn't need a test phase. That is, logic would dictate that everything will run smoothly. But if it doesn't work, we have to keep searching. We believe we're on the right path. And they are. The 2.4-ton machine is humming calmly and smoothly through the night. Now, all doubts are gone. One question, however, can only be answered with a risky reality check. Can this design and technology masterpiece attain the top speed it is supposed to? To find out, the car gets tested in a wind tunnel, as drag is not only determining the top speed, 
It is also important for safety. The Mercedes-Benz design chief arrives. He seeks inspiration from these classic curves. I have to say it's a historical moment to see this car here, again, in a condition as if it just came new out of the factory. It's almost a journey in time, especially the beauty, the shape, almost completely without any edges. It really is a drop shape, smoothened by the wind, so to speak, and that's the exciting, the aesthetic part. Tradition and modernity? To Wagner, no opposites. That's opening up my heart. Those indicators at the side, those door lines. I find these forms so classic that I think they're modern again. To me, a modern car could go down that design route too. The designer is interested in the interior too. And there's reason for that. The color scheme and the equipment are meticulously chosen. Especially the dashboard sticks out. You can see how this power of innovation of the outer skin transcends the interior by looking at the dashboard. This curved dashboard really is a continuation of the shape from outside into the interior. A stylistic device which years later is taken up again and used to this day in serial production. Another reason for the detailed reconstruction of the body. As far as we know, that's how it used to be and that's how we rebuilt it. The color scheme is muted in order for the driver not to be distracted. The comfort is supposed to make for relaxed driving even at high speeds. The last test before the reality check. The drag coefficient is evaluated. How streamlined is the vehicle? The previously calculated drag coefficient to get to 185 was approximately 0 0.36, 0 0.37, 0 0.38. If the coefficient were worse, it wouldn't work. However, it also has to be ensured that the car is still controllable at that speed. Is the vehicle stable? Is it prone to lifting somewhere? The employees of the wind tunnel are waiting eagerly for the results. We've got a drag coefficient of 0 0.362, that's 0 0.36, and that's really not bad for this car. 0 0.36, that's super. <laughs> a value which underlines the superb aerodynamics of the car, at that time a milestone and even more efficient than some modern sports cars. Additionally, an important realization. The car is very balanced and also fit for high speeds. What follows is the last and decisive act of the project, Papenburg in Lower Saxony, the high-speed test track of Mercedes-Benz. After three years of hard work, the moment of truth. The car has an inestimable value. Even the least risk has to be eliminated. We're just checking the wheels again. The tires are a big theme here, so we'll keep an eye on it. That's why the experts from Dunlop came too. The most important issue at a test like this is safety. That's paramount. Everybody knows that the last moments demand full concentration as the biggest challenge is yet to come. The final speed is to be measured precisely with electronic devices. 
We've been on the test track in Unterturkheim with the chassis, and we're also clocking speeds well above 100. But what we're doing today is a different kettle of fish. Warming up the tires. The car will now be tested for a speed which it hasn't attained since its rebirth. You start highly concentrated. Then you're slowly going into the speed territory where you want to go. You listen, is the steering functioning? Is everything stable? No vibration. And when you checked everything and say to yourself, well, it really does work, then you loosen up a bit. You show some emotion and say, wow, really great. And then you finish the lap. Everybody is happy with the result. But even now, you've got to be careful. I don't want to be too euphoric, but the conditions are great. Car stable. Let's see, step by step. After the first test, it's important to check the tire temperature. So if the tire temperature were too high, then we would have to abandon the trial without emotions. That would be too big a risk for everybody. Abandon, abandon. So how does it look? Well, 40 degrees. They seem to feel really comfortable now. Breeze comes up, an incalculable risk. So at the first high-speed trial with the car, it was already pretty windy. Also the side winds, we didn't want those. We didn't want any sideways acceleration. To keep the car on the road was getting more and more difficult the higher the speed. So had the wind speed gotten even higher, we would have had to abandon the trial. Now, the final moment has arrived. My family, my wife, my family, my wife, since they know me, they're used to my trialing cars. And especially that I don't do anything reckless or stupid. And to realize that with your responsibility towards your family and mine. Off we go. Let's do it. This feeling when exiting the turn and thinking, now is the moment, now I can accelerate, now it could work. And then you look, and there's 170, 175, and you know there's more to go. Will it be enough? Right. And you realize it's getting a bit viscous, ever more viscous, fighting against the wind. 182, 183. Driving above 180, and you know there's more. 185. It's a relief. It's a relief. That's exactly the value from back then. Electronically measured. We made it. Back to the roots. For Gerd Hamas as well. He's supposed to be the first to take a glance at the car. His car. A journey back to his childhood. The Streamline Car, testament to the art of engineering and design competence back then as well as today. And it can rightly claim one label, unique. <laughs>